साउंड वेव्स साउंड वेव्स की बात हो रही थी आई थिंक सर तो मैं कह रहा था कि यू हैव टू स्टॉप साउंड यू सेइंग राइट सपोज यू स्पीकिंग आई एम स्पीकिंग एंड वी आर शेयरिंग दिस इन्फॉर्मेशन बट इट्स हैपनिंग एट लाइक 330 मीटर्स पर सेकंड एंड यू सेइंग इफ देयर इज अ क्रॉस विंड दैट गोस राइट यू नो विल इट हैव टू वुड इट पुश द साउंड बट इट वुड बट दिस आई वाज सेइंग दैट द स्पीड्स आर नॉट दैट हाई See if it it has speed wind speed at 3 uh, say 30 meters per second they'll just reduce a, a maximum reduction from 330 to 300 right yeah that's still going to get the voice across so if a jet passes you as you're speaking will yeah. it carry my voice with it the you know like how after the sonic boom after the sonic boom a jet is uh, yeah. faster than the speed of sound yeah but i guess guess if it passes you while you're speaking you'll just get burnt or the heat generated from the airplane itself is going to burn you <laughs> so th- what you're saying and it not getting to you will be relevant at no, that more point. than that this the jet itself is producing sound yeah right so engine. Th- that engine that's producing sound and while the jet is moving at the speed of sound you know that uh the jet is kind of lagging behind its own sound that it just produced a, a moment ago hmm and if it travels faster than its sound the sound that it previously produced it creates a compression of waves while producing yeah. new sound that the sonic boom is really that the Achha, sonic boom the sonic... is when the current sound produced the waves that produce are produced from the current sound huh. meet the waves that were previously produced in a high compression and then you pass through that compression that's when you break the sound barrier so, so you get that boom because of superposition of waves compressing together those wave fronts to produce a loud sound sound so it's like a bomb yeah and it's that what's produced is a sound the sonic boom yeah it, it's not a wave no it is a wave it's sound, a, a sound it's a wave yeah it's a wave a series of compressions all the way up to you ha huh. i get so confused like uh, so for light to travel you need to have space yes for sound to travel you need to have air yeah you need need a medium and Any space medium. is not emptiness there's things within space that help carry the photons across absolutely photons travel within space hmm we, we were talking about space time earlier yeah so from point a to point b there's a disturbance a, a field disturbance and if you're talking about light then it's a field that is you know oscillating okay um and a field is an intangible Uh, you know as we know it you know uh, so just imagine that uh, you have this space but it's like a matrix of you know a network a net a mesh going towards you each point is a distance away and then each point has a time signature so at if every point in space you have different times so uh while a wave tra- travels there's a kind of a disturbance of the field between the between you and me Hmm. you know we we would experience that as a as a you know photon transfer or energy transfer from hmm. one point to the other so light needs you know a disturbance in the medium the electric magnetic field between two things which we huh. call space so it's like that oh my god i mean abhi mere liye to just trying to understand time as it uh as a wave form as a wave or what is time i mean what is time it's a, it's difficult to it's a unit of measurement a, of change a, right yeah i mean in terms of in an effective practical an interval ways. between two events would be the best way to describe time an interval between two events but yeah it's a it's a measure of uh, observation to another observation you know that's what time would be yeah you know like we wait in our heads let's say with a moment of silence and that's an observation right you took a sip, a sip of tea and between you picking it and then keeping it back that would have been an interval so you need two observations and the measure of the delay between the two is what we understand as time yeah that the, but it's a strange thing because uh, uh, most things that you measure are are perceived through us uh, senses are one of our senses right so like uh, you say like light i see it it goes into my retina but time we measure it using these clocks and stuff but what, how we experience it is just consciousness like 
it's what is past it's gone already you know like um and there's i was just reading there's another way of looking at time the time now the past and the future are all there at the same time yeah yeah that's uh, called it uh, eternalism so that that's known as eternalism that's a way of looking at how is that even as in oh there's this uh, you know there's this uh, book about a about a, there's a race an alien race that beyond this that lives beyond time and so they are outside the realm of time i forgot the name it's with t that their species is known with t right they, they, and what they do is that they they look at the world as all events that could have occurred and all events that would have occurred or and have happened already as a long spectrum hmm. and and they can kind of enter into any time they want this particular species yeah so i mean it's a good interesting concept so that's, that they have that, access that's to the idea holes. of eternal they've got yeah. wormholes yeah they they've got portals of entry you can call it or they've got you know slices they can just slide into and out of so this this was their powers anyway so that is that concept is known as eternalism when you think that all events ha- that have happened and all events that could have happened or have already happened and we're just experiencing be- the interval between you know those two things you know as we live yeah that would mean that there's no free will yeah that would mean that there's no free will that means it's you know it's all preordained and almost a design i mean you it's it gets again philosophical it's less scientific but i mm-hmm. i mean i'd say science is, stems from philosophy, philosophy anyway so um but yeah is that's an interesting question though is what's time the time could be um i mean in science it is just periodicity i guess you know if something repeats itself yeah um, and then that happens period periodically you then i guess you can predict yeah i think i think that's how time works it's kind of a cycle almost yeah and then given that pattern recognition co- comes from time but i mean there's the newtonian time right and then there's the einstein relative time relativity wala time yeah yeah so yeah. what was the change there that occurred like how did we see it before and then later we we decided it's completely different well see um newton had a linear uh, way of looking at time you know entropic in its nature you know, matter disintegrates to entropy kind of increases so so New- newton had his um you know linearity with time as time passes by order of entropy only increases and then more randomness you know prevails then there was this guy another scientist uh, james clark maxwell mm-hmm. who through space and time had you know uh, come to a, a number uh, um 2.9979245 i know that because i teach physics so mm-hmm. into 10 to the power of 8 that's almost mm-hmm. 300 million meters per second and he said mm-hmm. this is the, the limit this is the value to which time that that speed can travel and then the two things didn't go together yeah uh, at least it didn't go together up until einstein you know einstein had to come up with a special theory yeah. to to correlate the two what so what you said is Newt- newton and einstein i mean the, the difference is that james clark said something uh, newton said something they contradicted each other in terms of space you couldn't have had a limit you know Um, you yeah, know to 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 s- to the speed of anything because relative mm-hmm. velocity would have said that you know if you're traveling towards me and i'm traveling towards you we add the velocities if we observe each other speed relative to us right mm-hmm. so if you say i'm traveling towards you at mm-hmm. 30 meters per second mm-hmm. and you are stationary then i'm really traveling at 30 meters per second relative to you mm-hmm. but if you are traveling towards me and i'm traveling towards you our velocities would add up and similarly yeah. they would get subtracted if you're traveling in yeah. the same direction so uh, interestingly this didn't apply to james clark's equation and james mm-hmm. clark said you know you can't, you can't travel faster than the speed of uh the 300 meters per second million meters per second how so, did he come up with that 
And he came that up uh, by, by looking at two constants, really, permeability, permittivity. Okay. Basically, the electric field and the magnetic field have a mathematical uh, relationship. Okay. So you can have del dot B and del dot S, uh, del dot E, and with respect to, this, to S. When you, you know, so the, 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 the thing is that he, he mathematically came up with this value. It's a mathematical one of, you know, speed of light is one upon root of mu naught, epsilon naught. That's a proper equation. Mm. That's the limit of the speed of light. Mm. And that contradicts Newton's world because then you can't apply relative velocity to things. Mm. Uh, it could not be done until Einstein. Who mm. Einstein said, um, you know, something has to change. Like either length has to change or time has to change. So either distance has to change, you know, mm-hmm. or time has to change for that speed to remain constant. He kind of reconciled the, you know, the two theories. Mm. And it probably, I mean, I don't know if that's an out-of-the-box way of thinking, but certainly it's, it, 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 uh, it's a mesmerizing way of thinking of it. I mean, I don't know how you come up with such an idea. I mean, you could be a you could have studied math and physics all your life and not, not thought about you know. Let's make both happen. Yeah, it's almost like art. Yeah, and like you know, coming up with something like that. Well, it's fascinating at times as well in in sciences that uh, two different people have come up with a similar theory around the same time in in history. So uh, there's this idea of emergence of you know that that the idea that education or certain knowledge is there for a theory to be reconciled with another one. That somebody has to have done the, the research or the discovery or the experimental data to justify a certain theory. And then the theory gains momentum. And two, three people like evolution around the same time as Darwin, yeah, yeah, there was yeah. another guy supposedly had like uh, the fever, the hay fever. And like came up with this idea and sent it to him. He was 20 years younger than him. Yeah, but yeah. since Darwin was the botanist who was dissecting the animals and had the empirical data to justify his yeah. theory, um, he was able to present it before him as well. And also Darwin was pushed to present it faster because he's like, okay, wait up. Other yeah, people yeah. are coming up with the same theory. I got to yeah. take credit for this, you know? He, he, no, yeah, he didn't take credit for it for 20 years. No. Darwin? Darwin. He yeah. had it for 20 years. He kept it, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. his wife was religious and you know, his theory was controversial, to say the least, so... And, and that's what happened. And he kept it. Is the descent of man? Or uh, before that? Yeah. This is the descent of man. That's descent what he kept man. for yeah. so long. So he had the theory a long time ago. He just didn't come up with it. And come out with it. But getting back on the time thing, yeah. you speaking of animals and how they evolved, you, you had mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, uh, the elephant would probably see the time slowly and hummingbirds yeah. would s- perceive time. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's also the Pixar fa- cartoon thing, right? When they show the world from an ant's perspective, they show the uh, the human being, it's like... Uh, or the way we see a slow loris in cartoons. That that kind of idea has been exaggerated by Pixar and all these guys, but I've often thought that the heartbeat, the way the, the speed at which it, we operate, um, it's almost like an internal clock of time running within us. And that that speed would dictate our perception of time. And I yeah. don't know if that's true or not, but that's just the way it's felt. Yeah, I think it was Galileo. I think it was Galileo who, you know, uh, I think spoke about periodicity first. As mm-hmm. in, so the story goes, I think, he, that he was in a, a, a basilica and there was a chandelier that was moving. Mm. Every time there was a stronger gust of wind, it, it just displaced more. And every time there was a, you know, a light breeze, oh, it just jostled about its point, but but a small displacement. Mm. So what he noticed was that uh, that um, even if the oscillations were large, or whether the oscillations were small, the time between successive oscillations was the same. Oh, so it's strange. It's it would not be intuitive if you if I do this in my class, I would tell yeah. someone that what if I displace it more and I release it's traveling it? Traveling more distance, right? It's traveling more distance, shouldn't it take longer? And yeah. everyone says it takes longer. 
Yeah. It takes the same time because it's also traveling faster. Faster. On an average. And dips yeah. faster. So it dips faster. It's faster. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so, so Galileo had, had, had figured this out by putting his finger on his pulse. And he counted the pulses. What a guy. To see how many pulses passes. So. And so he matched it that there was a, it was the same pulse. So, uh, so that's what, you know, it, yeah, you're right. You know. And we st already started measuring things with our pulse. Uh, probably the first periodic thing that we knew before we even realized that it, this, you know, we see the sun every, you know, so and so solstice, and then at this point, and then we see the moon, a full moon every so and so days, you know, 27.8 days or whatever. Yeah. So, that's, I think before we counted those, we probably were counting heart rate. I think that's how we measure things anyway. Yeah. You know, so humans would, uh, it's natural that we counted with the heart rate. Uh, but even if we didn't do it because without intelligence, we probably had that as a clock anyway. To yeah, because perception things. of time yeah. is affected by it, right? Exactly. Just in a, in a very intuitive way. Yes. Uh, without you having to actually yeah. like count. Yeah, but I, pro I probably would. I probably would say that. Um, I don't think uh, elephants would see the world as moving fast. It would just think that the world is that way. Yeah, you know, um, like or the way we would think about rodents who have like seem to have a very small attention span for like the absolutely. way the speed at so, which they fucking so move we, and shit. Yeah, probably that's how it is, and you know, for them it's just this is how we are normally. You know, <laughs> um, so I don't think you'd you'd observe another creature at or they would have the cognition to understand fast or slow, but I know that they would measure things by that at least, and that's probably the the natural way things would go. Uh, using your biological um, internal clock. Yeah. And then that's how uh, even circuits work. Circuits work on a, on a, on a, with a crystal oscillator. You know, so many megahertz. But, you know, the, the, when you buy or purchase a laptop, you're always asking, you know, how many gigahertz. You're really asking <laughs> yeah. for the, clock, the speed. clock speed of a crystal oscillator that just oscillates at a periodicity. So we're always looking for periodicity, I'm guessing. So that I think... Um, it's know. funny how like initially to me like just the megahertz or the gigahertz of the processor was what dictated the speed and as I've as we've gone further it's like just making the architecture of the central processing unit more economical to use even a small clock speed to get more processing power out of it uh, th that's kind of changed initially I used to be like what's oh, so megahertz <laughs> now, I'm not necessarily, that number doesn't impress me. Yeah. I just kind of look at the benchmarks of the results of the processors, you yeah. know. And uh, that's changed a little bit. And but, uh, and also, we don't mention them anymore, it seems. Yeah, yeah. Back in the time, Pentium yeah. 300 yeah. megahertz. Necessary to measure, you know. What's now, they just kind of go like i7 and i9. They're like marketing terms. Back then, there was this nerdy, geeky sort of hertz and, and, and frequency. yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then just cooling your laptop and <laughs> cooling nitrogen laptop. coolers and all of that. Oh, yeah. I'm still in But it's in interesting. Even that's a, like a time discussion, you know. Right now, we, we're looking back in time for an event that already took place. Yeah. So. And, and like within the, uh, the central processing unit or the computer main motherboard, things are happening on a certain clock as well. Yeah. So there's a time ticking thing for them as well. It's almost like when life is born, the first thing that it feels is a biological clock not even feel like perhaps even before it gains consciousness the biological cl clock starts ticking like in a womb a child's mm. heart you can start seeing that it's forming as this semi-gelatinous looking goo -goo 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 thing going you know and that's rhythm and then yeah. that's music too uh, music is also like beats per minute it's uh, it's to a meter yeah and um, what's the what kind of entropy wise like Newton said it's like as we grow older our clocks kind of slow down a little bit don't they? I mean I would say um, that I mean that, that, that's a totally different the way we perceive time versus you know what is really happening you know I know athletes would have a heart, you know lower heart rate and on average but that yeah, probably do. doesn't mean that they're viewing time slower, mm -hmm. um, you know, or for someone who has a high heart rate, it, you know, it wouldn't be that they are seeing time, 
that has know, to or, lot or, to do with your subjective emotions yeah so i think how we perceiving it we probably looking at look at bigger things like when do you start on the bi- biological level i mean when do we start feeling hungry let's say it happens when you know that the stomach acids have to be at that level the you've already digested food the stomach is you know collapsing onto itself perhaps <laughs> to give you a signal of hunger and then similarly when you get full so th- like there's this time to do so because it takes about that much time to digest on an average so you'll probably sleep because you're tired at that time so yeah. already there's a rhythm i think on the biological level if at all we started to develop uh recognition of order hmm. i think that is what would give uh, you know uh the importance of the evolution of time let's uh, for measuring time at least time always existed whether you measured it or you didn't yeah um you but, kind of but i the, wonder where it start like it started when you the sun sets and rises and there's a pattern to it so you're saying when does the time start or when do we start started measuring starts for human them. beings yeah. like from a very basic evolution starts like if we was to start from the beginning and then go forward it would be the sun comes out sun, a sun goes down that's your day and over the day certain patterns of behavior are, are repeated by organisms because of uh, you know light uh, as it changes things so you'd have to hunt in the morning or some would hunt at night because of the eyes and stuff but then the the flowers blossom and flowers close that would be your seasons as well as the thing across the day how the birds wake up like if you hear birds in the morning that's well it's always morning when you hear the birds and night you hear those insects kicking kicking you got the crickets going on so the perception of time is tied into nature completely yeah or but, the measurement of it for us right yeah but, but probably um see if you look at and the animal would be doing it let's say it you could take it in in reverse so um of you know the the there are frogs that know exactly when they need to um lay their eggs and then fertilize it because of the rising tide that would exactly cover it at a particular time now hmm. you might say the preparedness level shows that it knows about time even though it might not um uh, necessarily be doing it by some intelligence that innately it has it's much more of a biological, biological thing. you know uh, it's not conscious at all yeah subconscious, subconscious. thing that is happening uh, you know it's it's passed on from from offspring to offspring and as a practice it's doing it mimetically or whatever right but but i think humans on the intelligent part of recognition of time would probably be what i would call the first time you think where did it start where did i think the the understanding of prediction um for benefit or to maximize benefit i think um, and in using intelligence for that like you know harvesting at a particular time hmm. if we wait to harvest at this particular time we would maximize the yield if if hmm. you planted it here hmm. i think when you started to produce for more than what you uh, maybe necessarily need as well that's probably when the first time you needed to exploit time so like an ag- agricultural revolution yeah maybe that's when we started recognizing or measuring it with that precision yeah but i wouldn't say revolution i would say um, hunter gatherer time surplus yeah so. small surplus yeah probably i got a bison yeah. i just killed this bison exactly. you guys want meat exactly okay this guy helps me a little bit <laughs> every time he helps me a little bit i'll give him a little bit more meat you know <laughs> <laughs> so so time that way on the scientific front you can argue what you know what is time really but and um, there's something called time dilation the time, what's time dilation time dilation is uh, the idea that time has to slow down to accommodate for the speed of light you know in the event that an object has to move a, a particular distance but you know if it does cover more distance it could not have had the same amount of time because otherwise you'll be traveling faster than the speed of light so time would have to dilate to accommodate for that and that means time slows down for a person traveling at a high rate or a yeah. high um, you know traveling at a high speed that's the same 
Einstein experiment. Exactly, exactly. It was like the Interstellar, the movie Interstellar. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That, I found that unbelievable in Interstellar a little bit. I love mm. all of uh, Nolan's films, but when he comes out of... Uh, no, but it wasn't just Nolan. And Nolan, they, he hired the best scientists they, that worked collectively. Nolan, I wouldn't say hired, but I'd say the, he, they them. worked with. You know, and yeah. uh, um, I think it's extremely scientifically... I just watched a documentary on it. It was extremely scientifically sound. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what the documentary says. But it's also trying to uh, convey scientific points that are not visually showable in a visual medium. So when it tries to show a concept of time in a way that a whole conscious human being transfers from one book in a library to another time space. Yeah, yeah. Like, I kind of went like, okay, this is kind of CGI, like graphic-y. But it's something that we would not be able to observe but to understand theoretically in a symbolic way. Because it's not yeah, visually showable, point. right? Uh, I get you. Uh, you might, might always almost say that, um, you know, is it a scientific crime to try to put something as such as eternalism? In, because that's what it was. You know, you're outside looking yeah. at all the events that have happened. And that's exactly how I was visualizing it when I was mm. telling you this, the thing. Mm. The, I didn't realize that it's probably from the movie as well. So, yeah. so that is, how, you know, that uh, you can probably see all events at the same time and then just sandwich yourself anywhere in the middle. That, how else would you to depict it? How yeah. else would you uh, project it? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think it does explain these UFO sightings. <laughs> that some people have seen, like, you know, like uh, there's these military videos of like aircrafts were flying around and then they see this thing appear all of a sudden, which is like a flying object, unidentified, of course, it's a UFO, but it's not functioning off of jet propulsion. It doesn't have like, it's got anti-gravity. It's just got no engine that they can think of. It's mm. using some sort of energy that we have don't have access to. And uh, so like all of these sightings that people are like kind of theorizing about where they come from, because like it's military footage. How could you fake that shit? Yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, there's... Sometimes it's a bit difficult, though. You get this information, you're looking at it, and you don't know whether you, you know, it's credible. At the same yeah. time, at the same time, uh, you know, the, there are, there's so much of information on UFOs as well that it, you, you just yeah. cannot you know, look away from. Yeah. Uh, if you start binge-watching watching these things, it never <laughs> it stops. It takes you into you know? a yeah. really... It's the speculation can go into absurd things, right? So there is the danger of kind of spending the whole night looking at the Illuminati or the, or the UFO sightings and then making up your own concoctions of beliefs that have no scientific grounding whatsoever. But would it now, I mean, at one time, maybe it would surprise, you know, someone if they probably saw an alien, but I'm genuinely interested. Like, would it surprise you if... You saw, I mean, if someone said, we saw an alien and it's, they've captured an alien and it's true, hmm. or something like that. I don't know. Would it surprise you? I, I mean, should, so let's say like these, some of these sightings are about 13, 14 years ago. I don't know. I mean, I guess it, I would say this is a Hollywood film immediately. It's like when someone says like, oh, there's a UFO, you got to see this video. Because we've seen so many fake ones and I've never seen in my own personal life, I haven't seen anything that resembles an alien. So <laughs> um, I would be surprised for sure. It's a yeah. difficult to keep secret for so long. Area 51 and all that stuff. Like mm. I, I kind of go like, it's so difficult to keep that secret. There would be one alien amongst all those aliens that's the idiot that kind of goes like, oh, let's just go to Muru. Let's talk to Muru. And why hasn't he come to me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Prob I mean, I don't think... Would I, you be surprised? I, yeah, but I'd, prob I'd be surprised. To, to, I'd be thrilled, actually, more than surprised. You'd be thrilled, ah, yeah, that's like, why. Wow. It's a discovery time. Like, let's ask them all the questions. Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd be confused, though. How, how could the alien be captured... <laughs> and how did it travel from the other local, not the local group, the outside of that? Because we know in the local group, there are none. Mm. The, in our, like, whatever is... Men in black type of thing. What if they are living among us? <laughs> yeah, what if my memory has been wiped a few times uh, every time I've seen the alien? Right? It's possible. Mm. 
so why are you doing this this uh, this particular i mean piece on time though I mean, yeah. what's the genuine interest so i, I kind of uh, listened to this podcast um radio lab and over the years they've done a few things on time and i've kind of understood it to a certain degree but of recent i've just like for some reason i just uh, developed an interest it didn't happen when i was in o levels and they were trying to teach it to me i was like what are they saying <laughs> you know <laughs> or a levels i was like come on man i don't want to study this it's just the right time and some things is kind of click in like you know hmm. maybe i just like kind of developed an interest and like i thought i'd and one of the things that i kind of feel is a problem is that abhi bhi dekho hum the minute we want to talk about science we have to switch into english because the language does not exist in urdu yeah that's the thing and i look at like anything on youtube you kind of go like time no, it does. science it does all you see is uh, pseudo science yeah yeah no the, the language does exist it's not like you know every now and then i just joke with my students i go like you know um n- Uh, 9.0 i said that in english and i say zarab 10 ki taqat manfi 6 or something like that in urdu right <laughs> just because there are these 10 ki taqat manfi 6 is like 10 to the power of minus 6 but i think uh, i think we just haven't spoken in that language you know darja e hararat instead of you know that we just don't speak in that yeah it's We easy don't. to say degree centigrade yeah. and i think um also i don't think um as such in in this urdu language we'd have too many scientists conversing in urdu as That's well the problem. so, so i thought my interest in time was one of the reasons was you know i'll have a conversation with you and i'll try to understand as much as possible about it so i'm like legit at least <laughs> try to be legit uh and then translate it all into a palatable understandable comprehensible thing in urdu oh that's interesting so the documentary should be like a discovery channel looking documentary on time okay but in urdu visually like get all the allegories right you know the metaphors like let's say if i'm in a car and i'm traveling away from the ghanta ghar hmm there's one on sadar as well yeah so what is the empress market what is it called empress market yeah empress market's got a ghanta ghar hmm. i'm traveling away from it but my car is traveling at the speed of light time will stop to exist like will it mm. stop exist like uh, my watch will stop beating i ek to i matter yeah, yeah, yeah. and what, i what will happen is but, but this is exactly like that the einstein's thought experiment you know i thought in einstein's thought experiment he travels in a train yeah and he travels away from the it's just a thought experiment he travels away from like a clock mm. and he 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 thinks you know that if he did travel at the speed of light yeah then the light coming from the clock would be barely catching up with him huh. and basically never reach him yeah so for him the clock would remain exactly where it is that time will locked into that yeah. light that he his received will, on the, him will keep beating right and then in real the, the clock would probably be beating i mean probably it definitely would be beating at the at its original site at you know s is equal to 0 t is equal to 0 where it exists that clock is yeah. just passing by yeah but the clock you Relative know that that him. einstein gets to see because he is traveling away from that light that was supposed to reach him to tell him that it's passed he's traveling at that same speed mm. of the light that is coming from the from thing so he mm. always mm. sees it at the same spot same yeah so he never sees time pass by i mean that's literally how he, einstein envisioned the dilation of it that the time would his time would have to slow down essentially yeah because he's not really getting that light or he's getting it slower yeah so and, and this like this experiment i think they were where they actually wanted to prove it, it's like they put people in an airplane with diff- two different clocks and watches on them yeah 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 and there was a 3 minute difference yeah as fast as the plane can go there was a 3 minute difference or something yeah, yeah. 33 second difference no no it's a very small time and very point 3 seconds though huh. but at the same time there was a difference is what matters and this happens all the time your gps satellites yeah they all fit in, they all they have clocks fit in them that are already adjusted for the relativistic speeds because they travel at such high speeds because they're traveling at such high speeds in in space there is an enough of a time delay to cause the you know time dilation to occur 
So the clocks really slow down with respect yeah. to us. Yeah, yeah. You know, not not really even, but with respect to us, they slow down, and they yeah. actually see that time. And it, I, the, the cool part is that time delay occurs for any form of time at any clock, meaning that if it's an electromagnetic DC powered battery that is clicking away on L uh, LCDs versus it's a grandfather clock swinging or or if it's a hand clock you know that is they all will slow down it doesn't matter what digital form or analogous form it is and, and it slows to down to the same proportion yeah that's uh, that's pretty crazy yeah wow i mean how do you go get your head around that in that i guess uh, the fabric of space and time the way you look at the even the, just the solar system, let's say, that you've got the sun, you've got the rubber sheet, right? Uh, oh, and that sheet that the planet is pushing down yeah, yeah. on. It distorts the space. Distorts the it. space, dips it. Yeah. How does that affect time? And how does that justify the relativity of time? Because that's a part of the theory of relativity from yeah, Zen, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's like this, see? Uh, so, again, that is an amazing example, by the way, the fabric of space. I mean, at least it, it gives some amount of visuals to something that would be almost impossible to think about. That the fabric of space mm. and a mass introduced in that fabric, it's being used all over YouTube, this particular video. Mm. And, you know, and then it bends space. But when it bends space, it, what happens is it creates a potential gradient. Mm. Like, it creates a reason for mass to fall from one point to the other, which we interpret as a gravitational force. So, okay, okay, yeah. So, it creates a reason for a fall hmm. from point A to, to a lower point now, a lower or, you know, more negative potential. Hmm. So, it falls towards that. And then we interpret that as movement or falling. So, the bigger the planet, the greater the dip. Mm. Also, the greater the, the slope rate, right? Mm. The potential gradient. Mm. So, it would fall much faster. It's like falling off a cliff this time instead of falling off like a, a slide. Now mm. you're just falling. And if you create a really high mass that's dipped the fabric almost vertically, so now it's literally like, you know, you just fall off an edge of something and mm. vertical down. So it's a very high, very steep, very fast fall. In other words, you'd be attracted by a heavier mass at a higher rate compared to, you know, a smaller mass. Mm. So we interpret that as gravity yeah. or acceleration, you know, a yeah. force of pulling or something like that. That's quite the wrong way to look at it, but yeah. Attractive force. Yeah, force. So. But it's like, uh, then that way, like the, the moon is pulling us and we're pulling the moon. Yeah. Because that's mass and we're mass. But we're like a, we, I say, Earth. Earth is like a bigger mass, so it's pulling it more. No. Then it is pulling. No, no, the no, Earth. no, no. The other way around, actually, it's pulling it with equal forces. So let me explain it to you in, okay. a, in a little different way. Okay. You're on an island. Mm. You build a raft. You sit on that raft. You move into the sea with a rope for the hope of whatever, right? You want to fish or something. You're trying to survive that island. You mm. said, I'm going to find land. You're in the middle of the sea. You see a boat, a ship, not a boat. You see a ship. You decide to lasso your rope, throw it onto the ship, and lock onto one of the masts. And you do so. You manage that. And then you start tugging on that rope to pull the ship back to your island. Mm. But, the, but, the, but the ship doesn't move. I mean, your whole raft and you begin to move towards the boat while you're pulling the, towards the ship, while you're pulling the ship. Yeah. So even though you are pulling the rope, yeah. you move towards the ship. And the, the real reason is that the ship is pulling you too. It's Newton's third law, it's action-reaction. Huh. So the, 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 the ship is pulling you as you pull the ship. Huh. Huh. Okay. Because you've got a smaller mass, so it's, you move and the ship doesn't. So when the earth is pulling the moon and the moon is pulling the earth, they're pulling it with equal forces, right? 
because it's it's like the rope between uh, the two. Isn't the mass gonna add to the ultimate force, like F is equal to m a wala like thing? No, that, well, well, between two masses, the force is not a F is equal to m a relationship, even though it is, which I'll explain because if a itself is actually dependent on the other mass. So I'll explain. Okay. Yeah. So let's say F, there's your mass and my mass, and we are like these two planets, you know, yeah. I'm the moon and you're the earth, yeah. right? Now, why are you being pulled by me? Because of my acceleration. Hmm. So it's your mass, but the acceleration that I created, you can say, on you. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. So why did I produce that acceleration? Is because I had mass, right? Uh -huh. the, the, the real force between two masses is the product of the masses. It's related to the product of the masses, and it's inversely related to the square of the distance between our centers. Huh, okay. So th that's how it's related. The further we are, the less of the force we feel because it's inversely related to the square of the distance. Yeah. So the closer we are, the greater the force. Similarly, if you have two masses and you're a very large mass, and I'm a very small mass, but because it's a large number multiply a small number or a, or a small number multiply by the large number, the product of the masses is what it's directly related to. Uh -huh. okay. So the force between us is equal and it's opposite, but it's related to the product of the R masses. It's like 8 into 3 is the same as 3 into 8. Hmm. So you get it? Yeah. So the, the force is not the larger one will have a greater force or the smaller one will have a greater force. It's both have equal forces. That's why they're together. That's why they experience one force between them. Yeah, okay. Like a rope that you tug on. So that ship raft example, hmm. the force which with, with which you pull the ship is really the, sh the force with which the ship was pulling you. Yeah. That's why only you move it's connected towards. through this one yeah. tether. Yeah, so it's and like so a, it exists within that. Absolutely. Huh. I mean, um, so the so you got the Earth right, and you got the Moon. We we're going around the Sun. Yeah. Right. With, and then we're spinning. with an imaginary tether between the sun, the sun and the earth. And then the earth and, and the, the earth moon and the moon and have the a small tether, tether, you can say. Yeah. Small tether there as well. Great. And the sun and the moon also have a separate tether. The sun and the moon have a separate tether, tether too, absolutely. Well. But let's say we Not can't as much see. as our tether with that. With absolutely. Moon. Right. So so you've got a spinner spinning going on, which is a day, and you've got the rotation, which is the whole season of the year. Right? So with the spinning, we're pulling no, we're not pulling. We're pulling each other along? Yes. With the spin. Exactly. And the earth is spinning, and the uh, moon is being pulled by the earth's tether. Exactly. Or the, or the tether between us. Exactly. Okay. So they're, they're pulling each other. Hmm. So, so, so there's a hammer throw event in, in the Olympics. Okay. Right? I mean, you know, the one, there's a chain and a large ball at the end of it, and then yeah, the yeah, I've seen it. person yeah. holds it, and then he swings or she swings around. So when they do so, there's this like, I mean, because it's so small, you can't really see the event. So when they show an audience view, you just get to see the person with a very odd kind of uh, conical motion. motion. <laughs> like a, it's called a precession. Okay. But that's, hap that's happening because each object is pulling each other. So there's this wobbly kind of, uh, you know, twisting motion. Huh. And that goes around, that's around an axis, an imaginary axis. That's called precession. Huh. So that happens, you know, between two objects. Interesting. And we understand it to an intuitive degree. Yeah. Because we're using it in a... a and this interesting thing about ath athletes is that they understand the laws of physics to the point that it seems like they can even bend them at times. <laughs> the great yeah. ones, right? Like, you're like, oh, how did Ronaldo do that with the football? How did that happen with that ball and that bat? That defies the laws of physics. And that's where the audience really kind of goes like, yes, he broke physics, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Almost like the athlete's like this aggressor on physics, like he wants to destroy the rules and take over and take control over the rules. But ultimately, we're all good, tied by good, these rules. It's a good thing. I mean, you make a... Uh, Athletics is really um, battling the laws of science at all times, you know. See how far the javelin, javelin can go. Yeah. See how far you can throw something. See how far you can jump, right? You know, 
how high you could jump or something like that right so it is literally always trying to break the laws of physics yeah. that's what sports is not a bad competition to have with nature you know and it's uh, there's there's a thing with the athletes uh, as well about time and their perception of it like you hear the description of like an athlete like running really fast during that 100 meter race that he kind of beat everyone he's like when i was running time slowed down i could see that guy go like <laughs> you know <laughs> um and those those 15 30 seconds however long it takes him to get that 100 meter it's Man, a no, slowed it's perception of his nine, time 9 point something seconds yeah 9.16 well, yeah, seconds yeah i don't i don't really know the exact 9 <coughs> yeah 9 i think those 9 seconds last like uh, months and uh, uh, they're in this high functioning sort of mental state where decisions are all very consciously tried to be thought out as well so the, a lot of them say that time kind of slows down you remember that one race has longer than it happened it was like why do the chuttis that we have after school you know they just go by like that the holidays just went like this cuz you enjoyed it you were focused on something but that one teacher who you didn't who's really boring and you're listening to him that time it doesn't pass <laughs> i mean uh, um, it's interesting to you don't probably look at uh, people who who've had experiences with you know psychedelics and things like that and i think that would be a um you know or, um, i don't know if it's a go to topic or not yeah. no that's fine yeah but it's but you know it's interesting to see how i mean that's another idea but if you have as many neural pathways connected at one time to an event because that's what would drugs would probably do uh-huh. would and definitely time slows down for them and they've always said you know we've had a time uh you know dilation of sorts you, anybody with any kind of psychedelic would would have given yeah. you that experience so that so i'm i'm thinking now the perception of time is a completely different um, discussion to have it's a philosophical discussion to have like because sometimes you would feel that several hours have passed in a small time interval i'm sure it happens with people who don't do that as well like people who don't uh, take uh, you know uh, drugs or things like that and like you've had a power nap yeah. and you wake up and it may have been like 12 minutes and then when you wake up you genuinely might feel like you've slept for you know 8 hours eight or so. hours um and if you take you know the report from any one of these people they said they genuinely would feel that that much time has passed and then you would say maybe oh that's subconscious you know maybe that's not the case but then there are people who have also had moments go by in on a trauma uh, with a trauma or a trauma a traumatic experience you know or an accident or something like that and they recall things in slow motion yeah so even though that must have been a fraction of a second, second. because that's when they were reacting and then they account for the events like as if it occurred in slow motion and they had more than one depth of perception meaning they could change their view yeah so i mean one would wonder if if time uh, is as we interpret it is also subject to a new you know interpretation and yeah. or subject to a new definition as in um probably they'll have to do research on this to come up with a good definition of what time is yeah i mean the perceived, perceived time is at least perceived time yeah. right yeah there is no atomic like clock is there a oh there is like from let's say the singularity where there was no time right and there's everything after that is what time is yeah from from after the singular that moment of the big bang if that is an ultimate atomic beginning point of time then everything is relative to that time is that a possible thing is there like a a, a greenwich mean time gmt there is like a you will uh, or is I mean, it always it, relative i wouldn't give it that name the greenwich time or i wouldn't <laughs> even give it i get what you're saying though yeah. um but it is i mean at least at the only scientific understanding we have of time is observing uh the observation of light the observation of the phenomenon hmm. that's the only metric of, of measurement 
Yeah. At least measured time. That's what I'm. That's why I separate it. I mean, time as we measure it is an elapsing or a continuous decay from an event that you're talking about. The Big Bang, let's say, or the singularity is what they say. It's from, I mean, that's the only scientific way of looking at it. I mean, there are other ways. Literature does so much of justice to, yeah. you know, time. But, I mean, uh, I can speak the, science better. It's like the, not they say that necessarily. The, 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 there's a philosophical aspect of it that you were saying and reminded me of that. You know that poets have said things like uh, moments of pleasure last to few more a yeah, small yeah. time and then you know dread lasts forever eternity yeah and like uh, there there is certain research on like how we perceive time ke andar ke agar aap bore ho rahe to waqt bada slow guzrega and what is boredom let's say like you know contemporary day days not having internet and sitting with just your own thoughts could be considered boredom yeah, boredom absolutely uh, but that is boredom is where creativity would come from it would like yeah. if you're sitting you, and you're constantly absorbing new information you're not creating your own at that point you're just looking at something but having a blank page in front of you you some, some might see it as boring and some might find something to do on that blank page and the idea that i think this this kind of discussion that we are having right now hmm. let's say um, you know rewind you know go back like 2000 years you know when the you know post roman time you'd say when people were philosoph philosoph uh, philosophizing at that time i mean talking just sharing information i mean if we are doing this on a you know in a proper you know sitting in front of mics and doing it i think <laughs> they would be doing it just naturally you know, because they have you know time on their hands so they yeah. would talk and they would think about time you know not just you know do one research on time they would think about it yeah you know i think we just don't sit and talk i mean yeah. you know we're taking time from a schedule aaj aur we is time pe milenge you know like this is the right let's program it so we we making slots available not yeah. just contemplating which i think philosophizing should be at least on things like this on on the basic you know observations that we've had for so many years and mm -hmm. that would be something that um, i think it would be treasured in, in the years to come because i don't think um we will be left with any time you know given our routines and our formatted lives yeah to have discussions like this yeah so well, the funny thing is the practicality of it dictates that you even schedule the time that you feel like is not going to be measured yeah like i said like uh, the other day kazi called and i was like okay i'm coming i, I got to go in 30 minutes like some work that i had to some deadline but i sat there and we started talking about uh, capital and how capital is very passionate about it is like you know all capital should be practical i didn't realize that like, by the time i was leaving his place is 12:30 i sat there for 4 hours i sat there for 4 hours with most people those that time doesn't pass <laughs> it is just like <laughs> when do i get out of here it's been 4 hours come on you know this happens with like good conversation yeah with good conversation good right. jamming session of music yeah. you know like exchange of ideas time just flies by yeah sometimes and you, also, you could just be jamming and you wouldn't know that here we're supposed to be like you know one and a half hour playing the same thing same thing we yeah looped how many times did we do it and what did we do in the middle and that that you know um, and it's not like you you know you pre-recorded your tracks you just playing and playing and playing and sometimes you don't know the time has passed yeah i think, think there is this condition uh, that some uh, patients have it's like a film on it too it's called awakenings with uh, robert de niro and robin williams rest in peace um uske andar ek condition hoti hai ke brain ki koi swelling hoti hai the no the exact name of it but what ends up happening is that you slow down to the point that if you're wiping your nose you're going like and to you i look like i'll be halfway through wiping my nose i'll be like this and the way they figured out that these guys had some internal clock issue going on is they time lapse them you record them in like oh. one picture an hour and they found a continuous movement of him wiping his nose uh 
but the condition is such that but if you throw like a ball at them their hand just goes up and they grab it so it's like somehow this swelling of whatever part of the brain has led to the change of the biological hurts that the person is functioning in hmm. and he comes across as the world most people creepy because the guys is looking at you like this and hmm. going like that and for him he just went like this for a second right but to you he was staring at you for so long <laughs> while he was trying to wipe his nose uh, it's very interesting it's called i actually know the name of the condition um oh. It's called. So you said it's in the movie Awakening as well. Awakenings. It's called encephalitis lethargica. Lethargica. Ah, oh, encephalitis. Yeah. Lethargica. Yeah. It's called sleeping sickness. Sleepy sickness. It attacks the brain, leaving some victims in a sta- statue-like condition, speechless and motionless. So it's because of the. What's it because of? It's because of the swelling of the brain. Oh, the swelling of the brain. Okay. Yeah. certain part of the swelling of the brain but they they're not giving the reason why that brain was swelling yeah. no there's uh car crash victims okay you know many different like naturally occurring swelling of the that part of the brain mm-hmm. and there three this is one of the less caused there's one part which makes you fast as well it's like talk like this what are you and he's like talk like this you don't even understand what he's saying he, he speaks so fast you know <laughs> his biological clock has has been thrown away why and they threw they, there's like this experiment where they put these two together right so the slow ones and the fast ones both have the same swelling in the same part of the brain but sometimes it ends up being this thing and sometimes it being ends up speeding you up and uh this guy is throwing the, the guy who's fast he's throwing a ball at them so the guy says the administrator of the experiment says count till 20 and then throw the ball so he goes one of the guys is not ready his <laughs> counting is super fast that it didn't even seem like he counted that fast and the uh the the reaction speed of the slow guys was still fast enough for them to go like this like just the hand came up fast enough but everything else was slow in their body it's oh. a very strange condition like when you look at these people they're like black and white footage on youtube all over the place oh the guy like like this the loogie dropping down you know oh. and, and then they, they speed up the footage and he looks normal all of a sudden <laughs> So when you look at that you go and go like time is biological completely because it's mm. the brain is a matter that you can actually boil it down to the functioning of a part of your body. Yeah, yeah so I mean this is I mean it's a, it's a strange thing I've never heard of it before but it's I'm fascinated now. Um <laughs> so then it would probably only add to that point then about perceived time. Yeah. So I think even whether you're under the influence or whether you're sick or whether you have some brain condition like you just mentioned yeah uh, so i think how you perceive time would then be the definition of it as well like you know you define time by how you perceive it yeah so you know what would one second look like to the fast guy or what would one second look like to the slow guy I yeah mean, but and or to you or to me even we might have some small differences with how we perceive that one second as and in moments of focus you know that might look like an eternity for you thing. yeah and a moment of boredom it's a different a focus yeah. is like time yeah probably time. yeah yeah on boredom sometimes you feel the time doesn't pass by forever yeah. you know that's yeah. not sometimes most of the time that's or the worry case. worry is also yeah. like when you're sitting and ending. worrying time is not passing for sure yeah, like yeah. you looking at the clock where is where is my son i hope he didn't get killed in an yeah, anxiety and those yeah. things it's funny how that i mean so time then would be how you perceive it and how it elapses in in, act, in actuality so and what is reality to begin with is in the other things you you know uh i was just telling um some students of mine that what really is red you know and this is my o level students and and red is um a wavelength let's say 660 you know uh, nanometers that's the wavelength of red light and i said so red light of this particular wavelength enters your eye you know there's a resonance uh, at the rod and cone levels and an electric pulse or a synapse uh, was generated beyond that 
it's literally electricity you know some potassium sodium ions transferring between you know from synapse to synapse, to synapse until it triggers some part of your brain within the nervous system. within and you remembered it as red to you so you called it red well yeah. Um, because those same exact triggers took place when you first saw red, saw red and called it red. And called it red. So, it's funny. Between all of that interval, time had to elapse for that to take place. Hmm. You know, between you seeing it and you registering it and then you understanding it or interpreting it. So it is then to do with... Well, luckily enough, we're the hum human race, so we have able to get other things outside of our own nervous system that define red as a universal red, right? So you've got the frequency number, exactly. We got the frequency number, but we don't know if you are seeing orange or green. Yeah. We know you're calling it red. Yeah. So you may have always been seeing green, but you've always been calling it red. You get it? So... Yeah. Um, that's what but I guess it doesn't know. matter as long as, like, you know, we're yeah. all agreed on blood is red. Exactly. And then this, if this blood that looks red, I mean, uh, what's inside my head? Yeah. It could be completely uh, different. And yeah. what, what's inside that, uh, you know, the praying mantis has a far more sophisticated eye. Uh, and as far as the retina is concerned, they can figure out more shades within red itself. Yeah, yeah. They've got a, but their brains aren't evolved enough. To be able to interpret that actual the gradation of red that can be perceived yeah, through yeah. their retina itself, they've got more roads, more cones, or whatever that actual sensory perception is there. But the brain, the nervous system, cannot interpret those many gradations. Yeah, yeah. It was very strange that the organ evolved far beyond the capacity of the brain's interpretation of it. You know. But I probably it doesn't interpret it though the way we um, we think that you know. It, well, I mean, this is interesting because um, uh, we think we see with what with our eyes. I mean, I would I, I would want to kind of elaborate on this one. See, a, 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 a bat does not see, hmm. but it hears a cricket, hmm. and it can visualize one from the other as well. So it can differentiate between one cricket type and the other, hmm. right? Now, um, so it, if it can in, interpret sound reflection as the difference between features of creatures, <laughs> so um, is it really seeing? And distance. Is it seeing? Is it, is it, a recon is it really... In the brain, what does it do? It probably uh -huh. builds an image. I mean, does it? Or we don't and know. Or does it, 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 it understand image. colors? And if call it's it an image. constructed yeah. off of sound, can we call it an image? Exactly. But it is. But, but we do that with, We do that with ultrasounds, don't we? Ultrasounds yeah, we is, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is making an image out of sound. Yeah. So if we are doing it, what is to say that the, the, the bat doesn't do it? So then what, what really is sight? I mean, and we start questioning uh, that level of, you know. So that I'm saying, so it's interpreting, interpreting uh, sound as light or light as sound. I mean, we at the brain level, we don't really know what's. We just know that a certain kind of pattern is is common to all humans when they see this particular thing. And the deviations within that, the yeah. people who who hears uh, who hear sight and. Yeah, like yeah, that's synesthesia. That's, synesthesia, right? synesthesia like, yeah. That's 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 like, when you, when you see colors with sound. Yeah, and this is like Pharrell Williams has this condition. Yeah, yeah. So Many musicians like don't have them. Listening to Happy, his song that he made, and he's like, it's purple for me. Mm. And I'm listening to it again. I'm like, I really don't see any purple, or hear. Like, I'm I'm trying to project it. I'm like, come on, <laughs> make it happen. But I, but I he think, can think... hear like colors coming out of those speakers, and for me, there's nothing. So I've read people with, you know, who have deliberately influenced themselves with certain kind of chemicals to get this experience. Oh, is that possible? Yeah. I think with I like, oh, chemicals and stuff. Yeah. 
like I haven't heard of like I know acid gives you like an extra like it I, I haven't heard of the auditory like part of it being mixed into the visual oh, uh, with, with psychedelics well at least that's the experience that people have said oh okay so interesting you know that I yeah. wouldn't mind inducing some of that experience on me just to f- figure out whether that what yeah, that, have that control, type though. of consciousness is. It's more understanding ultimately, right? Yeah. I mean, if it's if for scientific purposes, I would say, you know, it's important to know what sides of the brains could you trigger and how could you use them to you know benefit. Mm. I mean, let's say it's superpowers as such. You know, if you could hear or smell you know, sound. Yeah. <laughs> it would be something totally... I wonder if that could even be possible. Uh, but, but smelling sound... Like a sound, dog can smell you from so far away and or smell a, an intruder inside the house. Um, and there, there was a Richard Dawkins documentary where he says, he was talking about the dogs having the ability to differentiate between uh, two kinds of uh, acids. Hmm. You know... Caproic acid and something other. I don't remember the names. There were two acids. And the dogs can differentiate between the two acids. Just like you differentiate between two colors. Interesting. So it would say, this is one acid, this is the other acid. If it could speak, it would say the names because it does point out to which acid it is. Wow. So um, we can't do that with acids for sure. Yeah. And a dog can like possibly like go into a room, smell the couch and be like, rock was here. And Rock had this to eat in the morning. You know, like... <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> how, it could be. how far they kind of go with that? Because a dog can smell another dog on you. I don't see, like, another dog on me, but when I go to, like, I have a dog, <laughs> I go to a friend's house, I see their dogs get excited because they can smell my dog on me. You know? Yeah, yeah that's... Uh, and, like, they can smell that. They can kind of go, like, oh, here's a new guy. He has a dog. Maybe if I'm nice to him, he'll take me to that dog. We're but friends. But getting to that point, then, that, then that's another thing, you see? I mean... Obviously, it's a different topic than time, though. <laughs> but what's interesting is that when a dog smells, let's say if it could, and why put that away? I mean, maybe there's an experiment already done that where it could tell you, you've eaten this, Muru, hmm. for this dinner at this time. If it could do that. Hmm. Um, you know, just one smell would give you much more information than you think, uh, you know, just you're supposed to get. So why not, mm. if you could enhance those abilities, yeah. getting back to that point, why not, you know, if you add two abilities together to say, you know, I know where you've been. You've been to this restaurant. Yeah. For sure. You know, I have evidence. Forensic. <laughs> it's in my nose. <laughs> nose. <laughs> well, that just leads to a place like, it's almost like, um, you know, I know what you're thinking is where it's probably going to go. Uh, where, like, mm. I mean, if, if you stretch it to a tech level in the future you probably be at a place where like you can't lie to me I can tell what you're thinking and like the basic thing would be you walk into my room I don't ask you how you are because I know I can smell it on you like <laughs> I'm not going to say how, a rock how are you he's in a bad mood bro <laughs> smelling yeah yeah they can he's smell the mood. pheromones <laughs> and the chemical <laughs> changes that would have taken place when you have in this particular mood you have yeah, this smells mood. a little musky this today <laughs> Probably, probably. And that would be like the most transparent place where you kind of like hear almost like... It would be scary though because I know what you're thinking, you know what I'm thinking. But if we both know what each other is thinking, my stupid, jealous, resentful thoughts will be in front of you. My negative thoughts will be in front of you and yours will be in front of me. So we'd probably be like cool with them then, you know. The shit that you don't say. Yeah. You know, like a guy walks into the room, you're like, I fucking hate that guy. But you only say it to yourself. <laughs> and the minute you say, I fucking hate that guy, everybody hears it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. No, but uh, if you could do that, there'd probably be no need for conversation, would it? I mean, That's not you, the problem. You not have conversations, you just communicate. I mean, yeah. Probably, you know, have a moment of silence and just... <laughs> <laughs> Being. <laughs> We're just like interconnected. We're almost like a neural network then. Right? Because yeah. you're, I'm connected to you, you're connected to me, we're all connected to each other. It's almost like the neural network. I, I wouldn't say that we, we aren't in, as well. You're continuously giving out information, you're continu- continuously signaling, there's continuous um, chemicals being released, you know, from your body. 
yeah. and waves are being released. Um, there's light bouncing off you at different angles for the smallest possible gestures, and we just don't have enough of uh, transducers, sensors to to pick that signal yeah. and interpret it at the same time. And it's, maybe a time would be, you know, there where you could receive everything, every single chemical release or pheromone or you know gas yeah. or anything could be interpreted, analyzed, deconstructed, and you know. Um, I think I mean, humans don't have that utility. many, you know, transducers. We barely, you know, uh, know how to read each other in body language wise these days. Yeah. Well, you know, I think going down the <laughs> evolutionary <laughs> cycle. Yeah, we're becoming anti-social because of the the web connectivity, right? So the like the the kind of face-to-face -face, uh, communicative signals are lost because we're not used to that type of input anymore. But um. I mean, if, if I was also thinking it'd be too much information to know everything that's happening in a brain because it's very messy, the brain, right? Like the thoughts would probably be scattered. I'd, I'd probably had like six thoughts while you were discussing uh, that topic that would be like static for you. It was like, oh, what? Are we talking about this? We're talking about that? Yeah. You don't want to have that happen. Mm. Uh, but it'd be nice if there was like a machine that was on the side processing all that information. Rock came into my room. Rock seems to be sweating. Turn the AC on automatically. Don't tell me Rock is sweating. I don't need to know Rock is sweating. You know, but just turn the AC yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like a, a... And use it for commercials. Outsource your brain, really. Outsource um, your brain. Amazing. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, that's what's already happening. <laughs> we, you know, we are doing that. We allow machines to make decisions for us. You know, um, my friends program their lights to turn on, their garden lights to turn on. Yeah. The room lights to turn on, the music to play at this time, and you know they pretty much programmed exactly how they want to live. And uh, I mean, I don't know. There's, it, again, it's it's a philosophical topic. You'd you'd say that I'd love to have the music and the curtains draw exactly like I do, and this particular channel to play. You know, very uh, a very science sci-fi kind of world where you have everything happening, but then you pretty much have submitted. Mm. to outsourcing, you know, things for you. You're not really doing it. And mm. I don't know, it's, it's again, a philosophical. Maybe some people want that. Maybe that's how the world should go. Yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, there's both ways of looking at it, right? It could go yeah. horribly wrong or horribly well. And it's a disposition, question of your disposition. Yeah. And then, and if that is the case, then you, you know, where are you, what are you leaving your brain to do? I mean, Again, you'd have all the time, <laughs> quote unquote, in the world to, to do something, which you really don't know what to do then. I mean, um, so, because everything is done for you, you just have to <laughs> let your body go and something will come and pick something up. You throw the peel and it gets picked up. You wouldn't probably throw the peel as well. You just <laughs> leave it and let it hang and fall on. <laughs> so... You need to think about it. Yeah, yeah, I often, like, you know, like on a very bas basic way, I wondered about this when the first automatic windows turned up in cars. You remember the teen and the window just yeah, goes yeah. down. And I was like, you know, I, I put all of these convenience in my, conveniences in my life. Like I can turn, I can turn the lights on off with my phone so that I don't need to go to the switch. And I do the, all of these things all the time where like I walk in, things turn on. I press one button on my phone, it, the whole room goes into cinema mode. TV automatically turns on, AC goes to a particular temperature, the lights dim. Um, but then I find myself getting fatter because the body needs exercise. So I've created all of this convenience and in the end, I'm wishing I had that window that went down like this. <laughs> so it used a little bit of my muscle, you know. And I'm trying to like spend more hours gymming. It's, it's, it's interesting how you start with the car and the window example and then versus not going back saying, you know, you're in a car. You're in a car in the first place, yeah. Because I didn't see that change, right? For me, the car existed when I was born. But yeah, human beings in general, we've got a car, but now we need to jog. And where do we jog? In a circle. We don't jog from our one place to the other for work, because we got rid of that. But we still need the jogging, so we'll do it in a circle, in a, in a strange place, in a very non-utilitarian way. I guess, I guess, see, and then this kind of winds back to the time discussion again. Yeah. You've done it because you want to save time. 
Yeah. You, you, so, you know, I want to get from point A to point B without walking three hours, get there in 10 minutes at this high speed so that I give myself the ability to do more in the same time. I wouldn't say we, we've done, the time is the reason, but, you know, we've, we've just packed more things within that same, within smaller intervals, you know? Yeah. Uh, had many experience rather, experiences rather than one. Or, and then there's an argument in, do you want to have many experiences or enjoy one experience to the fullest? Like, people would say, have you walked from Sadar to uh, Cannes Station, uh, you know, recently, and experienced that experience, you know? Yes, you've driven from there to there, it takes you two minutes, but... I don't know if it's going to be a pleasant one to tell you, you know, that. <laughs> well, not these days, maybe. Probably not, with the AQI coming yeah. now, but yeah. But I'm, I'm sure that, go back 200 years, the walk between Kant, which is which is now known as Kant, and, and then Sadr 200 years ago, would, would have been some experience with somebody selling something on the road, you know, people playing, you know... Yeah. Butter is happening along the way. Well, not 200 years ago, but you see, much more than that. But um, it would have been an experience then. So, yeah. I mean, I think what we've learned to do is um, share ideas, share experiences, and then create the need to have that same experience. Unfortunately, you still have the same amount of time to do so. You know, so you've mm -hmm. got to find faster ways of getting there and you can't do much about time though you'll want to teleport yourself at best that's the best you can probably do and instantaneously get from point an xyzt point. coordinate to another xyzt coordinate right yeah. so and then teleportation would be the delay or perhaps just the preparedness for teleportation would be the issue but you would get from one point to another instantaneously or at the speed of light i would say would be the right way to say it yeah. you couldn't you couldn't go faster than that and then, you know. Well, you couldn't even go there because you dematerialize. But I guess teleportation is dematerializing and reconstructing the atoms into another spot in the same configuration as yeah, they yeah, were yeah. dismantled yeah. earlier. Um, and then, of course, there's just a scientific uh, thought experiment, which is probably never going to happen because you, whatever arrangement you do, rearrangement you do would not be you, I mean, technically. Yeah. It wouldn't, yeah. Yeah. because you know the, you'll have the quantum problem of existence already in two places at one time. Only the realization of it in another spot in the same arrangement. You know, you know what, you know what I'm saying here. Yeah. Because we know you already exist in multiple places. Then if you can just propagate that <laughs> over a very large distance and then rematerialize yourself with the same arrangement in the same order it's really not going to be you because it's yeah. not going to be and why if you're at that technological level why would you want to have a body in the first place you just <laughs> map your brain into zeros and ones and yeah. and kind of upload no, but it yourself it probably doesn't into... have to be digital as well I mean it would oh, oh, yeah. it probably would have to be much more of a wave existence I mean I, and I like that idea I mean why would you need a material medium if, if space, that is the a case a wave of consciousness yeah floating in space which probably what energy already is. Waves of consciousness floating in space on a philosophical Consciousness note. is the problem. Uh, we, where does that come from in, in the first place? Consciousness? Yeah, intelligence. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Intelligence, though, you can still do IQ tests on, but consciousness is yeah. a difficult one to nail, right? So, and, and what is to say that the purest form of it is already existing, and that's what energy is, and mm. intelligence is you know, the transference of it, yeah, the purest level. The ether. Yeah. What it's they a used very to ancient call. concept then, like you go, you go back with that, but then it's also, it's mystical and spiritual enough or to, uh, to base a belief on even. Yeah, well, the, the ether was this, you know, um, this concept was debunked a long time ago. It's a nice scientific concept. Uh -huh. You know, that, um, it's like this material that gets released, you know, uh, when something dies or decays or is burnt or something, right? And for the longest time, they even thought that it was uh, something that was released. 
And there's a scientist, and I forgot his name, he's, he comes up with this experiment of covering a material and burning it. Hmm. And when you burn it, something is released. And he decided to measure this. Okay. He, you know, he says something is released and it, it has mass. It's called, and it, the material stops burning because this thing that it re released has saturated the air around it. He called it phlogiston. Okay. And the air was phlogisticated. Okay. Right? If, if, if it releases that ether kind of thing, right? And it gets lighter. And so he put experiments to do it. He burned something and he showed that it gets lighter. He says, see, what it has released is phlogiston. And for the longest time, people believed that because materials that burned got lighter. And then magnesium was burnt, but yeah. magnesium got heavier. Yeah. And so they said, oops, <laughs> theory didn't work. Magnesium <laughs> produces this ash looking substance though. So right? when you burn it, it gets, becomes an oxide. Huh. And that then weighs more than magnesium solid. So. Oh, wow. So that was the <laughs> you know, debunked. That's you know, debunked. <laughs> but this must have been really ancient, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, but then, of course, science has moved ahead, but time is where it is, stands still in terms of its development of our, I mean, our understanding of it. Yeah. Um, space time, was, you know, you can say was the last um, real understanding because of Einstein. And then we understood that they were interconnected and inseparable as in a way that you can't separate time from an XYZ Cartesian you know, planar system. So it is interwoven within it. One part and the other part have to have two different time signatures. And yeah. That's how it is. Interesting. I mean, well, if the universe is, let's say, so the Hubble telescope kind of does this thing where it, they measure the distance between two galaxies. Hmm. They're able to show that the stars are moving away from, and the galaxies are also moving away from each other. So the universe is expanding. Yeah. And since if the universe is expanding and the galaxies are moving away from each other, yeah. there was this point where it was one, right? So the Big Bang is justified as well at the same time. But the idea that if... Um, two galaxies are moving away from each other. There was a point where they came back and converged to one point. And that time around certain gravitational pulls can also go in reverse. So you got the black hole where time can go in reverse. Is that possible? Is it possible that I'll be young again? <laughs> <laughs> no, time I, machines and stuff like is there a is there, is there a possibility I mean see if if you take the, the eternalism concept okay. the, the way the science would look at it then um, then at least as we know it at least as we look at uh, time elapse the, the observable universe can only be entropic Okay. Meaning? Decaying. Decaying. Yeah. So, you today could not go back to yesterday. That's not happening at all. That's just violating the, the thermodynamic law. <laughs> you oh, can't do anything about <laughs> okay. it. Uh, but, so you can't observe yourself. Now, to, ex to extend it, to say that, th does that event have to be looked at as something that has already happened? Mm -hmm. That is what, uh, what, where science is. I mean, it's not, it doesn't look at it as an event it, uh, that has happened. We just can never observe it anymore. There was a, you know, a certain time signature of it, you know, and you're observing it ahead of it. It's like, imagine, that you could run, if imagine, I mean, I know you can't, but imagine you could bend space somehow, go to the other side of the universe and wait for the light to reach you of an event that you did right now. You wait for it to reach you. That would be the best way of looking at you in the past, hmm. where you kind of s somehow circumvented 
with a wormhole or something, got out of your parallel universe, went to a, a space-time coordinate system where light hasn't reached you as yet. And you're observing an event that already took place, like kind of a forward to the f- past. Hmm. You get my point? Yeah. So um, I think that's the only way you could view yourself in the past. Yeah. But, but every event that, everything that I've said, everything that you've said, all the, the, you know, the light that we've shared that has bounced off us, off us, um, that's already gone. You can only observe it if you actually bent and gone ahead of that light to see it again. Hmm. So for that, you'd have to change space. For that, you have to bend space to go ahead of. Yeah. To a part where light has not existed as yet, So, which is a contradiction. Does space exist in that space? Mm. Or can you escape the expanding universe? So, because time and space are being created as the world is expanding. So, there's an impossible, impossible argument to, to have if you'd want to supersede your own rate or your, the speed at which you exist, which is the speed of light. So, and they, you know, they mm. can't happen. So, mm. it's interesting. I mean, it's it's. Um, it's mathematically uh, impossible to do. The only what about like what they're doing at the, the that cauldron accelerator? Isn't uh, aren't they creating that exact thing, which is the point at which? Yeah, they they're they're creating a. I mean, it wouldn't be creating that same one, but it would be creating a, a similar uh, situation at least. You know, um, the similar conditions necessary for the for the event to occur but it's also interesting to look at it this way uh, so yes the galaxies are moving apart Andromeda uh, our neighboring galaxy is moving towards us yes there's a grander picture of it moving away but at the moment it's moving towards us as it stands in its progression and we collectively, Andromeda and our Milky Way, are, are also moving apart then. Mm. But for this little time interval, mm. it's moving towards us. Mm. So, and then were they to collide and, uh, you know, uh, and move their own ways, at least their centers, um, to a, ma- a larger and larger distance beyond that, right? But for now, it is moving towards us. So, what is to say that uh, it is this, the creation of Big Bangs is not a, a continuous crisscrossing of events where a convergence and then again a divergence and a convergence takes place. I mean, but there's no way to, to observe it. So, mm. the, so it's interesting, the observable universe is all that we can measure and discuss. Beyond that, beyond the measurable, the discussions are far more healthy, I think, in terms of philosophical, you know. When I say measurable, it's scientific. It's what Empirical, I'm trying to say. Yeah. But then beyond that, I mean, what existed before, you should never stop thought. I think thought is, is amazing to keep thinking. Definitely. But can we yeah. articulate it? The, the tools we have is mathematical, which is, and scientific. I mean, a hundred... Years from now, if we go back in the past, the the way we were articulating ourselves about time, there was no. Um, so there's this. Uh, when the steam, the railway started, that's when people actually started coordinating their times together, because the train had to leave at one point, and it would leave at that point. And if you went with the bank's clock, which was set at a slightly half an hour forward, you know, if you went with mm. some other clock which was set 30 minutes earlier you would kind of hit it, you know, like, people would be like, what time is it? Breakfast time. What time yeah. is lunch time, you know? So there's far less coordination required, and they really just started syncing their clocks up to the railway when yeah. they had to all sit in this one vehicle. And that synced us all together, and that's a uh, hundred years ago, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, to that, to that precision, I would say. Yeah. And now you're articulating it a lot better. So assuming an asteroid doesn't hit us and wipe off the whole human race again, like 
again that's a, so supposing mm-hmm. if the pyramids was a really evolved civilization back then but if it doesn't hate us and it doesn't destroy us completely 100 years from now we'll be articulating time in a completely different way and we keep discovering new particles right within things and the quarks and quantum mechanics has gotten so far the first quantum computer will be quantum computers might be in the home personal computers yeah why not i mean that's how it is i mean they have i don't know how true it is about the the you know encrypted code being broken by the quantum computing google quantum computing or something like that in in a you know matter of seconds but then 256 bits so 512 bit encryption cracked in you know matter of seconds mm. um because of quantum computing but I, i mean i don't know how much merit is there in it but or truth is there in it but why not why why wouldn't that be a reality or why couldn't it be reality i mean yeah. um processing um things have we're processing things better we are understanding things at a smaller level i'm sure that i mean the there might be a a future for at least interpreting time better i wouldn't know if um uh, maybe experiencing time better as well but mm. uh, but genuinely changing time that would be like you probably would be we have more success with us perceiving time slower than we would have with you know with a larger gravitational effect which is That's more like omnipotence yeah. that's like hmm? yeah you are you are the god yeah i mean yeah, that, exactly what you're doing maybe who knows <laughs> tell that was the, uh, the should we should we end it here for um, today 